I am Nora Shida, your MC for today, and I am honored to have all of you present in our conference today. Okay, uh, so we just start with the event and eventually we people will come. It's okay, thank you. Uh, let me explain to you a bit regarding MeTech 2021. MeTech 2021 aims to bring together academicians, researchers, and industrial professionals from all over the world to share their experiences in engineering and technology. It provides a platform for researchers, educators, and students to present and discuss the most recent innovation, practical challenge, and solutions adopted in their fields. The conference emphasized digital transformations and green technology towards IR 4.0 in the fields of electric and electronics engineering and mechanical engineering. Well, to begin this event, we are pleased to have Yang Babahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Ikram Shah bin Ismail, Vice Chancellor, Mahsan University. Yang Babahagia, Professor Ala Kisawa Rao, Senior Director of Mahsan University. Yang Babahagia, Professor Dr. Sri Kumar Chakravarti, Director of Research, Innovations and Postgraduate Studies, Mahsan University. Yang Babahagia, Professor Dr. Saad Miklev, Dean, Faculty of Engineering, University Malaya. Honorable Mr. Sunil David, Regional Director, IOT, AT&T, Chennai, India. Yang Barusa Dr. Iman Farshi, Dean of Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, Masai University. Yang Barusa Associate Professor, Dr. Abdul Rahim Sadiq Pacha, Conference Chair, Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, Masai University. And last but not least, all participants. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to call upon Dr. Muhammad Hushni bin Muhammad Harun to recite the dua. Please, Dr. Muhammad Hushni. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Just want to confirm again. Okay, um, let us rest. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalam ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Ya Allah Ya fa'alul lima yurid We express our gratitude to you for allowing us to attend the launching ceremony of Masa International Technology and Engineering Conference on this auspicious morning Ya Allah, we ask you for the safety of our religion and well our body. Ya Allah, Lord of the implementing authority, make the days that we have gone through, starting with your mercy, continue with your blessing, and end it with the forgiveness. And also make the days that we have gone through with guidance and end with the victory of excellence. Ya Allah, Ya Muhaymin, Ya Aziz, Ya Jabbar, let our efforts as a means to enlighten and convince ourselves that personal safety of either outer or inner is a prerequisite for achieving happiness and excellence in various fields. Ya Allah, grant us faith and strength in order to face the challenges of life during the transition period and in the face of life in this new millennium. Ya Allah, show us guidance and adjust our path and our ways to achieve happiness and glory. Let us listen to the people who like the good things. Let us avoid doing the bad and evil things. Ya Allah, blesses our life in this meeting and gathering and prevent us from harm and unfortunate events. Rabbana adina fi dunna hasanah wa fil aadhirat hasanah wa kina azabanar. Walhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, Dr. Hushni. May that do, uh, bless our event today, inshallah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to welcome Yang Barusa Dr. Iman Farshi, Dean of Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, for his welcoming speech. Please welcome. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Mr. Rashida. Okay, thank you everyone for participating in this event. Uh, good morning, all. Hope you're all safe and uh, healthy, stay home today and 
hopefully you can have a successful and enjoyable day today by joining our conference. So I would like to say all thank you and welcome to our International Technology and Engineers Conference, MyTech 2021. Uh, finally, we made it. Thank you so much for our team members that they done the best effort that to do the, to conduct this conference. Although that so many obstacles we faced during this pandemic situation, so you know it was very difficult. We had planned at the beginning to conduct this conference face to face, but however, due to this situation, we had no choice to make it online conference. However, I'm, uh, I'm sure that today, even by having this situation. Uh, we, we're going to have a successful event. So I really appreciate our team members, especially by leadership of Professor Sadia to provide a successful conference. I really appreciate all our distinguished guests that today and our management team to support our event today, which I can mention our Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Dr. Vikram Shah. Uh, our director of the research of Moscow University, Professor David Kumar. Our uh, managing director, the Dato Shari, and also our senior director, Professor Ella, that they really support us for conducting this event. And today also they joining us for this event. I really appreciate all. So today we have this MyTech conference. The objective of our conference is to bring together all the academics, uh, researchers, industries, uh, professionals from all around the world, which we have guests from Indonesia, from uh, India, and other countries that join us for today's event. It is also, which is field main field of the engines and technology. So the main scope of this uh, conference today we focusing on our vision and vision of faculty of engines and build environment on green technology, IR 4.0, digital transformation, IoT, that I'm pretty sure all of our researchers from Mass and other universities that they joined to this event, they want to show and present their most recent innovative practical challenges that they face, especially during this pandemic situation. All these papers also, we are pleased to say that we are the pioneer and the first faculties in NASA universities that we're going to use our journal, NASA Journal of Engines and Technologies. And I'm really pleased that we can start this conference by joining this journal, NASA Journal of Engines and Technologies. And it can be great success for NASA University and Faculty of Engines and Build Environment, which once again, I should say thanks to our research director, Professor Seri Kumar, to help us to start this journal from Faculty of Engines and Field Environment. So align this vision and mission which we conducted this conference for our faculties during at least past uh, six months, our faculty done a great project. For example, we are working with UIT with a project, we call it uh, Eco Village, which we want to have a smart, a small widget village in NASA universities by application of R4.0 and green technologies and today, all of our researchers are going to present their achievement and also their uh, activities regarding to this project. I'm pretty sure it's going to be very exciting conference day for all of us. I am really appreciate all of you to join. I'm sure that when, when you join us, you have a great passion to join our, to listen, to see what is the great advantage about, for example, this uh, Echo Village and a smart project that Faculty of Engineering is going to do it. Because we know that recently in this current situation, we really need to move forward to this digital transformation. We have no choice. We have to move forward and it's important for all of our staff, our students, and I'm sure that all of us, we are working hard to reach to the point that one day NASA is gonna be the best. And I appreciate all of you for this help. So today also we have a great speakers to join us to give their information around all around the world what is the advanced uh, application of all these new technologies and all these new ideas. So today we have Professor Rao. He is the director and the president of the Institute of Advanced Research from India. Uh, then uh, we have also uh, Professor Dr. Sat. He is the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, UN. And he is also great researchers from UM, especially by focusing on renewable energy research laboratories and so on. I really appreciate he's joining us from University of Malaya. Today, also from India, we have Mr. Sunil Devi. 
which is he's currently working as a regional director, IoT Center in India, China. So all these great ideas come together to make this event successful. I'm pretty sure everyone that joining these events are going to be very excited to see, to hear about latest uh, advancement in this current situation, although we had so many obstacles that we couldn't have this face-to-face -face conference. But however, we're going to present our best. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, to joining our event. Thank you so much, our senior directors and our management team from Mass University to assist us to conduct these events. And also, I should mention about Mass Academics and the Dr. Guna uh, and the teams that helping us, uh, Dr. Abdullah and the team also that helping us to conduct this event. So I wish all of you enjoyed our events. And for your information, it's going to be our first conference from Faculty of Engineering this year. We're going to have another two conferences. The next conference will focus on the uh, build environment, civil engineering, and architecture technology. And the final conference, again, we have the combination of all engineering fields. So I hope to see you again in other events. Thanks again. And I will pass the platform to Ms. Rashida for continued event. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice day. Okay, thank you, Dr. Iman, for that speech. Ladies and gentlemen, next, let's watch a video presentation prepared by Masa.
Thank you. I hope you enjoy the video. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, next is a special address by Vice Chancellor. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome Yang Babahagia Professor Dr. Dr. Ikram Shah bin Ismail, Chancellor Masa University, for his special address. Please welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning. Can you hear me? No feedback. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, firstly, I would like to welcome all of you to the first Masa International uh, Technology and Engineering Conference 2021. This is a conference organized by the Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, uh, which aims to bring academicians, researchers, and industry professionals from all over the world to share their experience in the field of engineering technology. It provides a platform for researchers, educators, and students to present and discuss the most recent innovations, practical challenges, and solutions adopted in their fields. Unfortunately, this conference is conducted entirely online and we are a raging academic, but I hope this will not deter any fruitful discussion that will follow. The theme of this conference is Digital Transformation and Green Technology with IR 4.0. As the theme suggests, the conference is to encourage research and innovative ideas that focuses on digital transformation and green technology with Industrial Revolution 4.0 in the field of electrical and electronic engineering and mechanical engineering. I will not go into details of this topic. Uh, I'm only a doctor. I'm sure Professor Sri and Dr. Iman will elaborate more on this topic uh, throughout the uh, conference. We have several eminent speakers, I was told, for this conference, and I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Rao Bani D. Mari, the president of the Institute of Advanced Research in India. I was told as the former graduate of IIT Delhi, India, Osaka University, Japan, and the University of Queensland, Australia. It is also where I did my undergraduate studies. So we are both from the same uh, alma mater. Uh, we also to welcome our two keynote speakers, Professor Saad Matilak, uh, who was until recently the Dean of Engineering at my previous university in Australia, and I'm Mr. Snow David, who is currently working as the Regional Director of IoT for at and India in Chennai. Finally, I would like to congratulate the Brunei Committee under the able leadership of Dr. Iman Prashdi, Dean of Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, and Associate Professor Dr. Abdul Rahim Sadiq Bacha. The conference chair from the same faculty. Finally, I wish all of you a fruitful discussion and a successful conference. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, for the speech. Uh, next, let us hear some opening speech from Prof. Sri Kumar Chakravati, Director, Postgraduate Studies, Research and Innovation, Massa University. Please. Thank you so much to uh, the MC. 
I hope you all can hear me. Okay. Uh, Dato Vice Chancellor, Dr. Iman, the organizing chair, Dr. Sadek, and the MC who always has a smile. I've seen many MCs who have conducted uh, events, but this MC always has a smile, even in the midst of the most confusing of situations. For example, in a conference, maybe in one of your events about three months ago, she always maintained her smile and calm and cool, just as does the Dean. Dr. Iman always is also a person who always maintains a smile, uh, despite whatever stress he is in. Anyway, thank you for inviting me here today to uh, uh, talk a few words on and about the conference and basically a little bit about the theme of the conference. But before I start, all I can say is uh, technology always surprises us. But I was taken by surprise when I joined into this uh, Google Meet today with the background of a, of a sea, of a beach. And I realized that your organizing chairman, Dr. Sadik, also has a beach behind. The last thing I want these 49 participants is to think that both Dr. Sadik and I are sitting on the same beach. So as much as technology caught me by surprise, technology also gave me the opportunity to react to a surprise immediately. And I changed my background to the library where I'm sitting in. So that is technology now. About Maybe 40, 50 years ago, the best of technology would have been listening to a radio. So as this conference and as your aspect, as your specialty is all about engineering and industrial revolution, I am happy that Dr. Iman and his team has have successfully decided to uh, organize this international scientific conference with your suitable theme, that is digital transformation and green technology using IR 4.0. So this is appropriate at this time because this is the time of IR 4.0. Now, many of us actually take IR 4.0 as, OK, this is something that has come now two years ago or three years ago. And let us implement IR 4.0, not realizing what was IR 1, IR 2, and IR 3. Now, if you go back into the historical perspective, the first industrial revolution started in the 1760s or 1770s where the industries were built up in uh, Britain and how we know about it as doctors is that that was the time when there was so much of smoke and pollution that pollution covered the skies sun could not come down the, the rays of the sun could not touch the skin and people developed vitamin D deficiency so the effect of the first industrial revolution was not only uh, um, uh, development of civilization but also development of disease the second industrial revolution, the first came in 1770. The second industrial revolution came in 1870. The third industrial revolution came in 1970, where electronics and technology started, computers started. 1770, 1870, 1970. So when should the fourth one come? I'm not taking a class, so I don't expect answers. The fourth one should come at 2070. But as you know, man, always likes to go fast. When I say man, I mean woman as well. I'm not a sexist. So instead of reaching the fourth IR 100 years later after 1970, 2070, we are reaching it at 2020, a little before 2020. So in just 50 years, which means IR5 may come in another 20 years and IR6 20 years after that. So as much as we like to go rapidly, our mind ensures that we also have the opportunity to advance and create things better. Yesterday, yesterday, my mother called me and said, can you hear me? Um, I said, yes, I can hear you. Usually my mother, when she makes a long distance call, she uh, cannot hear me because she is deaf. At the same time, she doesn't make calls. I'm the one who makes calls, and I had to talk louder. And she said, I'm in this shop where I'm selecting uh, behind the uh, behind the uh, a hearing aid 
by which I can even hear what is going on in the other rooms. And this is connected to Bluetooth. So I don't have a mobile phone now. It's somewhere there. But I still can talk to you now. I was really surprised and happy as well that she could hear me and she could talk. And she could actually talk to me by just pressing something here using a Bluetooth. Well, that is an industrial revolution which actually helps medicine. So the IR4 is the fourth, the basically the fourth industrial revolution is going to change how we live, how we work, how we communicate, like how my mother communicated with me. It is going to change the things that we value and the way we value them in the future. When the uh, owner, when the, the, the founder of Genting Highlands left China in 1960s, um, with just four dollars, it's a big story, a very motivating story. It took him 20 years to communicate back to his mother. For me, I can communicate with my mother about four or five times a day, or I can always be on phone with her, or I can actually see where she is in her country using a CCTV from where I am sitting. So it IR 4.0 changes the things that we value, the people we value and the way we value them in the future. As much as IR4 is as easy as changing the background in the in our Google Meet, unfortunately, we can't change people like we change background. How I wish we could change negative people just as the way we could change backgrounds. So for those of you who are into politics and who are into ministry uh, discussions, you may realize that uh, recently the ministry, uh, the government has formulated some uh, protocols to promote innovation, creativity, and competitiveness when it comes to the industrial revolution. And uh, at this point, uh, we have been from the Office of Research, we have been giving various updates to your faculty on many grants that you all can apply in terms of uh, IR 4.0 as well. And uh, in fact, the, the government policy also says that IR 4.0 uh, will be adopted even in uh, healthcare, which is of great concern to me and uh, our university as well. Now, what does it mean when it, it involves healthcare? With my mobile phone, we can I can track chronic lifestyle diseases. All I have to do is key in the details, and it will tell me uh, my predictive factor whether I'm going to get hypertension or diabetes or even if we have a lifestyle disease, it is going to uh, tell you the status of where you are. And this is a connectivity that is delivered by IoT. Now, IoT is a, a system by which I can sit in a remote place. Of course, you are engineers, you know it, but to me, it is a great technology. I can sit in a remote place and control things in other places. And now we have contact lenses that can detect glucose levels in diabetics. And I can monitor my caloric intake. A few days ago, last week, I was offered a cup of tea. I said, thank you very much. Please hold on. I just checked. I said, no, thank you. I've had enough calories for the day. So we rely on this for everything. So that is how life is. Uh, all these possibilities now are uh, extended because billions of people are connected to mobile devices. We have a lot of storage capacity. Our access to knowledge is unlimited. Even now, you take a, a six-year-old kid, sees a dog that's uh, uh, injured in the roadside or a cat that's injured in the roadside, and uh, he actually Googles and says, what has happened to this cat? The cat has something, um, the, the knee is bleeding. OK, this could be a fracture. The cat must have fallen or a car must have this one. Where do I contact somebody to come and take the cat away for an emergency? Everything is accessible. Added to that is artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, 3D printing, all of which you guys are doing, and nanotechnology, which our biotechnology is doing. So your expertise from the Faculty of Engineering could provide app developers and health publishers with a lot of insight on how to develop medical apps also. Well, I talk more in favor of health and medicine. I was going through the World Economic Forum a couple of days ago. It says that about two thirds of kids in primary education will end up working in jobs that haven't been created yet, which means those kids who are there now in primary school will be working later, 20 years later in jobs which are not yet created. There are so many jobs which we have now, which will be redundant. 
Now, I'm sure many of you have watched Hollywood movies where you see two cars zooming, the hero's car, James Bond's car zooming, and the villain's car zooming behind. And you see this from above, above a cliff. How did this happen? 1960s, 70s, 80s, when these movies were shot, there was a helicopter and there was a cameraman on the helicopter zooming in and the helicopter flew behind the cars. Now the whole thing is replaced by drones. You have a drone with a full HD camera and somebody else sitting somewhere controlling it and the drone flies behind the cars. That's how movies are made now. So what does this imply? What does this imply? Number one, you don't need a helicopter anymore. Number two, the helicopter pilot has lost his job. And number three, a cameraman who has to sit with a huge camera in a helicopter uh, loses his job. Everything is replaced by a 2000 US dollar drone. So you are saving on um, a few millions with IoT and artificial intelligence. So this is where things are going to. We are going to go for um, uh, professions where you don't need people anymore. Masa University is planning uh, an eco village where one of the proposals is to use drones to go around and make sure that security is monitored. When you have a drone to monitor security, you would realize that you don't need about 15 security people. So that is technology for you. So by IR 5.0, which is about another seven or eight years away, 80% of the world's population will have internet presence. You are doing a lot of stuff with 3D printers. The first automobile is planned to be produced with a 3D printer by you know, another six, seven, another five years. And 90% of the world's population will own a smartphone. What does this mean? It doesn't mean that the other 10% cannot afford a smartphone. It means that the other 10% are bored of the smartphone and they just, uh, they just given up on it. If 90% have a smartphone, that means 90% have internet access. And it is estimated that a lot of vehicles on the uh, roads will be driverless and many home appliances will be connected to the internet. I've got a few friends already when I visit their houses, as soon as he tells me, he sees me, he says, okay, Alexa, switch on the aircon in the hall. Alexa, please switch on the bedroom lights. Switch off the aircon lights. Alexa, what's the weather today? The same thing with me. I use Google Home. You can use Alexa or Google Home. So basically, we fall in love with nameless people. We fall in love with, with people who don't exist. But I guess one aspect of IR 4.0 is also having illusions. Imaginary people like Alexa and uh, Google. Now, for those of you who've watched movies in the late 90s and early 20s, there was a trilogy called The Matrix, starring Keanu Reeves, where they say that the life is a matrix, which is an illusion. We are living in an illusion. The reality is something else. The reality is bitter. Illusion is technology that makes us feel good. Uh, that, what we saw as fiction before, is happening now. I think it is illusion that's making us feel good. We're all virtually connected to different aspects of the world that we feel still connected even though we're disconnected. But despite all this technology advancement, we, it should come down to people and values. We need to focus on people and empower them. And in my field, I, we need to deliver services in a patient-centered manner and we take care of people. And in your field, you need to deliver stuff that is going to help the public. So having said this, uh, I saw the uh, itinerary in today's conference and I can see that it has a very interesting program and I'm glad that Dr. S Dr. Iman's team is keeping abreast of engineering developments in IR 4.4 and Green Revolution as well. Dr. Sadiq has uh, done a lot in, uh, in organizing this event and he's been at it for the past few weeks and I would like to extend my heartiest congratulations to Dr. Sadiq's team for your commendable effort. And uh, uh, lastly, I would like to thank you all for participating in this conference. And uh, I extend a warm welcome to all of you um, uh, participants from NASA, international participants, international speakers. And I hope this event is successful. When I say this, it shows that I have ended my lullaby. My voice is like a lullaby. And it's not fair to put you all to sleep early in the morning when you have a whole day of conference. 
So thank you very much for inviting me here once again and for the opportunity to be here today. And uh, hope you all have a nice day and a wonderful session. And stay safe and salam sajatara. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Sari, for that talk. I hope that that talk will inspire us. Thank you, Prof. Again. So uh, next, we're going to proceed with our keynote session. And this keynote speech is going to be delivered by Professor Dr. Saad Mikhailov, Dean of Faculty of Engineering and Engineering University Malaya. So let me tell you a bit regarding Professor Dr. Saad Mikhailov. Professor Dr. Saad Mikhailov is a professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering, University of Malaya, since June 1999. He is currently the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Director of Power Electronics and Renewable Energy Research Lab, Pearl. He is an IOT, IET Fellow and IEEE Senior Member. He is the Associate Editor for IEEE Transaction on Power Electronics and Journal of Power Electronics. He is the author and co-author of more than 400 publications in international journals and proceedings. With, with 253 ISI journal papers, five books with six patents, and more than 25,000 citations and 68 H index, and 116 PhD and master students graduated under his supervision. He is frequently invited to give keynote lectures at international conferences. He is also listed by Thomas Reuters Clarivate Analytics as one of highly cited engineering research in the world and included in Thomas Reuters' World's Most Influential Scientific Minds in 2018, 19, and 2020, three years. He is actively involved in industrial consultancy for major cooperation in power electronics projects. And his research interests include power conservation techniques, control of power converters, renewable energy, and energy efficiency. Wow. <laughs> so I'm so proud to have Dr. Saad with us today. Without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Saad Mikhailov for his keynote speech title, The Role of Power Electronics in Providing a Sustainable Energy Supply. Please welcome. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction to, can you hear me? Is, uh, am I clearly, can you hear me clearly? Hello? Yes. Probably. Okay, good. So can you sh see my slides? Yes, Prof. Are the slides clear? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, plenary talk. Okay, uh, so what uh, uh, I'm going to share with you this morning is something uh, we call related to power electronics and how power electronics can help us to solve some of our uh, energy uh, supply issues. And uh, one of the most important things is the sustainable energy supplies. That's the, the key words now, because I think we have uh, uh, an enough supply of energy in most of the part of the world. However, we are looking more into sustainable energy source or energy supply. So maybe uh, these are the outlines of the presentation. So we start with the, um, a brief introduction on the energy and the environment, and then look into uh, challenges in sustainable energy. And then we look into challenges in energy con conservation. And uh, what is the grand challenge? Okay, so these are the topics, the four topics that I'm going to look at, you know. So if we look into some facts, Okay, we can see that the world populations is increasing day after day. And uh, it's going to be around 9 billion by 2050. And uh, the energy consumption will be double. And this is very clear, you know, very clear. Uh, if we look into our individual energy consumption, it has been increasing 
year after year. If we, for example, just give you some examples. If we, uh, uh, if we look back 20, 30 years ago, how many people have mobile phones? Maybe, maybe almost zero. How many people uh, have laptops? How many people have desktops? How many people have uh, tablets? So the number of these devices has increased significantly. Okay, we don't talk about the technology part of it or the affordability or the size, but I'm talk I will talk about the energy requirement because these devices requires energy. And this energy had to come from somewhere. So if you look into a person who lived in 1970s and the person who lived in the 80s and the person who lives in the in the 2020, the energy consumption per person has increased at least like four to five times. Okay, so you can see the number of cars, the number of flights, the number of airplanes, the number of trains, the number of devices that we use, it has been significantly increased. So this means we are consuming more energy and that's the energy will need to come from somewhere. And based on studies, it's been found that 65% of global warming coming from energy generation and energy use. So it means the way or how we generate this energy and the way how we use it is not efficient. Okay, it means the processes that's involved in the generation, for example, if we take the fossil fuel, okay, from the process from the process of extracting this oil to, for example, to be used in cars or in ships or in airplanes, the, that process is not efficient. And then also the use, for example, if you take the cars, you know, the IC engine, you know, I call internal combustion engine cars are not as efficient as, as possible. So that's why the, there's a lot of emissions and there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we call carbons that is being generated during these processes. So, and uh, this greenhouse gas emissions already, we can see the impact of it. We can see there is an extreme weather conditions. So there are many places which experiences a very um, strange weather pattern. We see a very, uh, also sea level rise in many locations around the globe. We see also there is uh, ecological zone shift and this is based on some studies done by United Nations in the past 50 years. Apologies, Professor, lost... if I may interrupt, because your yes. PowerPoint is not moving. It's still in the first page. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, now it's moving. It's now in the, in the page number four. Oh, sorry. You should have told me before. You know, oh, yeah, sorry. sorry, sorry. Yeah, so uh, is, is this like this visible? Yeah, now it's in page three. Yeah, okay, thank you. But uh, if I share the whole uh, screen, let me... I think uh, entire screen. How about now? How about now? Can you see yeah, the slide? We can see the slide. Yeah, we can see the slide. How about okay, now? Now it is full, full screen. Now it's much better. All right. So uh, this is just what I have been talking just now. But uh, we will be nine billion by twenty fifty. The energy consumption per person is increasing, uh, and uh, the global warming is due to the energy use and the energy uh, utilizations. Okay. So we you can see the slide, slide number four. Hello? Yes, now it is at the impact of greenhouse gas emission. Oh, okay, good, thank you. So, okay, we see this kind of uh, phenomena, so this kind of weather patterns changes and the sea level rise, the ecological zone shifts and uh, what we call, uh, and in the past 50 years, uh, the world has lost more than 25% of its topsoil and 30% of its forests, so this is, something that we need to worry about. As scientists, as researchers, we need to look at 
how we can minimize or how we can reduce the impact of these greenhouses emissions. And uh, what's, uh, what's uh, most important part is if we continue the business as usual, at the current emission rates, coral reefs and polar ecosystems will be severely affected by 2050 and it reached to a stage we call it irreversible stage. Means irreversible stage, whatever you do after that will not make any difference. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's the, the most worrying part, okay? So if we need to do something, we need to do it now. Okay, and uh, as I said just now, we are not only affecting the, the, the ground, but also we are affecting the, our marine life. You can see, if you look into this slide, if you can see the, the acid levels in the oceans and seas, you can see the, um, this is around 30 years back, this is today, and this is by 2050. You can see the darker color here, the blue color, the, the acid level, the lighter blue means the acid level is low. The darker the color, the more acid levels. You can see, this was 30 years ago, how the oceans looks like. So the acid levels was uh, maybe manageable or acceptable, but today you can see uh, the color is getting darker and darker, means the acid level in the oceans is increased. And then we look into, by 2050, if we continue this way, also the acid level will increase in our oceans and our seas. So we are affecting or impacting both the ground and also the marine life. Also, we can see every day we open the TV, whatever news, we can see the floods. We see floods in, in many locations where it have never happened, including, for example, if you look into many parts of Malaysia, they have never been in flood, but in the recent years, we see floods, you know, we've seen floods in Kelantan, we've seen floods in Johor, we've seen floods in Tranganu. Maybe Tranganu maybe is used to the flood, but there are many locations in the north on the south never experienced the flood before. And that's due to our own activities. If we don't see floods, we see this. We see droughts. So many locations around the globe also are experiencing low level of water low level of water and uh, many places were green and now it tend to be uh, dry and become a desert you know and uh, a lot of people and animals also are striving to find the, the enough water for this plant so this is the, the the situation so also we can see the the earth temperature the earth temperature is keep increasing year after year you can see the the, the many places around the globe, for example, like if you look into Europe, for example, used to be one of the coldest places in the, in the earth. You now it's temperature increase. In 2011, more than 20,000 people died in France because of heat waves. And that's actually uh, it shows the impact, you know. And uh, last year, last year it happens, I was in uh, last two years, 2019, eh? I was in uh, one of the places here in. Um, in France, in North, uh, in uh, Grenoble. Grenoble is very famous of um, ski, and it's very cold place. It, the temperature reach in July, it's around 45 degrees Celsius. So this is, the, 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 you can see the temperature, and it's never reached that level before. So we can see that many places around the globe are experiencing high temperature. And that high temperature actually has its impact on on the melting of ice in the on the north and the, the, the south uh, polars and uh, also having the impact on the elderly people and so on and so forth. So these are the, what we see. So my talk will be based on this diagram, okay? Uh, uh, it's very important everyone understands what this diagram is about. So this diagram is extracted from one of the journals, one of the top journals we call it science, you know? Uh, impact factor around 45, 46. So this study shows the the emission level. You see on the on the y-axis is the emission levels, and then throughout the years. So based on this study, uh, if we continue business as usual, means as we said just now, we the, our generation is increased because energy demand is increasing. Uh, automatically the the emission level will continue to increase linearly this way. Yeah, because
because generation increase, automatically emission will continue to increase. All right. But what will happen if we decide that we want to stop the emission, but continue the generation? Okay, means our emission level will maintain, at least maintain constant, and generation continue to increase. And this is what we call this stabilization triangle. This stabilization triangle means, okay, you stabilize the emission level at certain point. For example, if we decide, depends on which year, for example, if we take 2020 as a reference point, so we take the year 2020, so we are at this point, so our stabilization triangle will be this. Let me take the so, so if we take 2020 as the reference point, so this is the reference point here, and then then this is the stabilization triangle that we need. So what does this mean? It means this is the emission, this is the current emission level. Okay. So if we want to stabilize it, so we need this green uh, triangle. If we take the 20, uh, 20 or 20, uh, 2005, so maybe this is the one here. So we need this stabilization triangle. So basically this triangle is meant that we want to stabilize the emission level uh, and continue increasing the generation. So what we have to do? if we decide to do this, okay? If we decide, we have to decide to do this, we need to do the following. One, we need to install one million, uh, two megawatt wind turbine, okay? Which is almost equal to uh, 300 times the current capacity. Yeah, you may ask questions why wind turbines? Because easily wind turbines will increase the the generation which we want and does not do a lot of emissions so it contributes to the reduction of emissions what else we need to install around 3000 gigawatts peak of solar power which is almost three uh, 250 15 times the current capacity yeah very clear because uh, solar does not uh, contribute to emission much maybe during the fabrication process, but does not contribute much to the emission during the, the, the operation. And it helps to increase the generation. Install around 700 gigawatt of nuclear power plants. Yeah, you may ask questions why we need the nuclear power plants. Nuclear power plants are not safe. Nuclear power plants are not uh, maybe um, dangerous. Yeah, but uh, you, we, uh, in energy, we believe on what you call the energy mix. You cannot depend on one source of energy. You have to have like a combination of different types of sources. You may have, for example, wind, you may have solar, you may have gas, you may have uh, nuclear, you may have hydro, you have a combination. You cannot depend on one source of, of energy. And nuclear power point, uh, nuclear uh, power has proven, okay, to be one of the most, how you call, uh, the reliable source of electricity generation, especially for electricity generations. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it has been shown the technology. I know there are some uh, uh, instances where it happened some nuclear disasters like what happened in Fukushima or in Chernobyl, but that happens in the, in hundred years. Two accidents happens in hundred years. This is the same when you, when you are talking about uh, accident, for example, if you talk about the how many accidents happens on the road, for example, by car or by walking or by motorbikes or by bicycle? If I ask you what is the safest mode of transportation, you maybe see the maybe walking. But if you count the number of people die walking compared to the people who dies in airplanes, you will find that more people die walking compared to people flying on airplanes. But when an airplane uh, crashed, everyone in the world heard about it. So this is the analogy. So the same thing goes for nuclear power plants. When it happens in Fukushima, everyone in the world is uh, talking about nuclear power plant. We do want to install nuclear power plant, but nuclear power plant is one of the most efficient actually technologies that can be used uh, in 
electricity productions. So this is one. And then also increase the fuel economy of our 2 billion cars. We have around 2, 2.5 billion cars in the road now. We have to increase their efficiency from 30 to 60 miles per gallon. What does this mean? It means if you have uh, one gallon of, of, of petrol it can take you, for example, for 60 miles, it has to go for uh, 60 miles, 30 miles to 60 miles, it means improve the efficiency almost 100%. Because the current IC engines the, or internal combustion engines is not efficient enough. So that's one of the Cut the carbon emissions from buildings by additional one fourth. Means during the construction, during the buildings, during the uh, this construction, we have lots of constructions happening around the world. Then we have to cut at least by twenty five percent. Introduce what we call carbon capture. And this is also an another important technology which we uh, it can be used actually to to minimize the amount of emission on the to the atmosphere which we call it uh, carbon captures, especially for the coal power plants, coal fire power plants, you know, and um, which is equivalent to almost 800 nuclear power plants because one, uh, one nuclear power plant, uh, one nuclear uh, power plant can be able to generate almost uh, uh, one gigawatt. So the size of, it's just an analogy, you know, what is equivalent to, so the carbon capture. So the question is, is this doable? Anyone? Can we try to answer this? Can we do this in order for us to stabilize the emission level? As I don't know, maybe some of you maybe are scientists or engineers or whatever. So from the so from the engineering perspective, you know, or from the you know application oriented uh, perspective, can we do this? Uh, yes, I'm sure we can do this, but it does, does, does the cost, the cost should also play the roles right here, I mean, in terms of the... If the cost means we can uh, do If it. you want to install, yeah, if you want to install one, one million, two megawatt turbine, wind turbines, for certain country, the cost will, will play a role because for some underdevelopment country or... No, okay, so for, well, well, let's take Malaysia as an example, for example, because this has to apply worldwide. Right, means can Malaysia, for example, okay, Malaysia, we don't have wind turbines, we have solar. Can we increase our current installed solar power plant by 215 times? Impossible. Economically or technically, technologically, it's not possible. We don't have the capacity to do this. So if Malaysia cannot do it, other countries, Maybe one country or two countries can do it, but the rest of the world cannot do it. So means we cannot do this. It's impossible. It's too big to be implemented. It's like something beyond the capacity and the capability of uh, each country. So what we are going to do today, we are going to demonstrate on how we, without doing this, we can achieve this kind of goal, which is reducing the emission level or stabilizing the emission level using power electronics, right? So uh, I think renewables, we already talked about it. So that's actually renewables. We want to see how renewables are uh, using power electronics. And then we look into energy conservation. Very, very important. You know, energy conservation is something uh, which everyone should practice or, or, which, or each one should live with. Energy conservation is, is the way how you use your energy or the way how efficient, how efficient you use your energy. I give an example, very simple example. For example, you, you, you are sitting in an air conditioning room, okay? We know the, the comfort or the most comfortable temperature is around 24 to 25 degrees, all right? So that's the the most comfortable temperature based on studies. Dep depends on the environment, depends on the locations, but usually it ranges between maximum, it goes lower as 23 and goes to 25, 26, within this range. But what would happen if someone put the temperature at 20? So actually your cooling energy will be very high because bringing down one degrees, actually it needs a lot of energy. 
bringing two degrees that consumes more three degrees more and then what will happen we we put the, the aircon at 21 or 20 and then what we do we keep uh, or go and purchase a, a jacket and then to keep us warm you see the analogy or not you put the 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 air conditioning very low and then you go and purchase another things which is to keep you warm so why we don't set the temperature at 24 25 so that is you can save a lot of energy and you when you look at this do look at at your individual level i know maybe some of us say okay yes i can pay for the electricity in malaysia the electricity is very cheap i can pay okay 100 200 ringgit but just think like this if you one person okay example we have one air conditioning imagine if everyone around the world that put the temperature at 24 degrees how much energy we can save there are billions of air conditioning so we can see the scale the same things for example light bulbs okay when you when you walk out from the room or you leave the office or you leave your lecture halls whatever you switch off the lights yeah, maybe from you as a student or as a staff, you are not paying for the bill. The university is paying for the bill or your father is paying for the bill at home. But think this way, how many bulbs are around the world? If everyone switch off the bulbs, if we assume that every watt just consume, okay, we take the most efficient bulbs now, around 10 watts, okay, for example. So multiply 10 bar. 10 watts, there are estimated more than 100 billion bulbs around the, the world now. So you just as imagine you multiply 10 watts per, you switch it off for maybe one hour. So 10 watts multiplied by one hour multiplied by, we don't assume 100 billion, we assume like 10 billion, multiplied by 10 billion. You can see the amount of watts that we can save. And that's what, Actually, it comes from where? It comes from burning the oil or burning the gas or burning the coal to generate this electricity. So when we look at it, we have to look at it on a global scale. Then you can see the impact of this. So that's why uh, I really like what uh, the ex-US uh, President Jimmy Carter says. Energy conservation is an act of patriotism. It means if you really love your country or you really care about your country, so use energy efficiently. That's the meaning. For example, if you want to, to I call to to go and get some food, you can walk. It's good for your health. It's good for environment. Why you have to drive? Then you cause traffic. You consume more fuel, parking problems, and so on and so forth. So these are the, the habits that we we uh, we need to live with it. We need to practice it as way of life in order for us to reduce our energy consumption. And when I see it, reduce energy consumption means it does not come on the expense of the comfort. Yeah, you can still live a comfortable life. When you put the aircon at 24 deg degrees, it doesn't mean you don't live comfortable. Yes, you live. But the only thing is you can wear a t-shirt. You don't need to wear a jacket. Because it costs you 100 ringgit to buy or 200 ringgit to buy a jacket and then pay extra for electricity bill. Why you have to do this? And this kind of energy conservation, before I start talking about renewables or whatever, we have to practice energy conservation. Because energy conservation is almost a zero investment. You don't have to invest anything. When you switch off the light, what do you invest? Nothing. When you turn on the aircon at 25 degrees, what do you lose? Nothing. Okay? So it's a zero investment. And this is when we do, for example, when we do energy audit for factories and um, organizations on how they can reduce their electricity consumptions, we always suggest a zero investment, uh, what you call initiatives, zero in uh, yeah, zero investments um, actions, and one of it, which is number one, is the awareness among the people or among the, the staff or among the, the employees. You know, the awareness how we make them aware through programs, seminars, talks, energy conservations, because that actually helps a lot. Because as for example. If you are the dean or the head of the department or even the VC, you are not going to watch everyone switching off the light or not. Yeah, but actually uh, nowadays with the AI and um, IR 4.0, we can see there's a lot of um, uh, introduction of automations and sensors which can help actually in energy conservations. But 
it has to be a way of life that in every one of us need to believe in it and live with it so these are the two very important aspects for renewables i think it's uh, clearly it's uh, many resources available and um, uh, in the last 20 30 years there has been uh, a lot of uh, uh, introduction of renewables in our supply system and uh, you know god has given us a lot of resources you can see for example only from the sun we have more than 2850 times what we need of energy so if we use only 0 0.0001 of what is being supplied of uh, energy by the sun is enough for us to, to to survive and we can see in the recent years there is an increase you can see there is a uh, quite a significant increase from 2010 to 25 percent to 31 percent and uh, it's, it, i think it will exceed the 31 percent by 2035 uh, at, at the current rates and this is i always show this uh, this uh, this uh, what you call uh, this airplane this is uh, it's not a commercial airplane but it's solar airplane you know it's one of the niche applications of uh, of solar applications where this airplane actually took off when make one around the world you know one journey around it took off from abu dhabi and it landed back and uh, the good things about this airplane it's maintained it's it's able to sustain and maintain all the journey just from the solar and we hope that one day from the that's the airplanes we, pl we fly in maybe part of the energy will be used from uh, from renewables Also, there is a study done by uh, by Q cell. You know this Q cell. This Q cell. Q cell. It's uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, solar cell manufacturer. Solar cell manufacturers we fabricate uh, solar cell, and uh, uh, it's a Korean Korean uh, company. A Korean company, and uh, they have an office in Cyberjaya. You know they fabricate solar cells. They have done study on their. Uh, uh, solar cell monocrystal line and the monocrystal line the efficiency is around 15 percent during that time okay and what they found they found actually if we install this amount of solar panel this q cell at this area here it's enough to supply the whole world of electricity if we install this it's enough to supply the whole euro if we install this it's enough to supply the whole uh mina mina is middle east and north african countries yeah maybe you can see this is a very commercial uh, uh what i call uh, uh presentations or commercial slides but for me if if even we double even we double or triple this size or maybe make it even six times six times you can see still it is still a very uh, uh viable solutions so actually, just install this amount of solar we, enough to supply the whole world what we need for electricity. And that's very, uh, very interesting. So even we look into the current um, system, solar systems, you can see a large solar uh, plants. But it's always what we need. We need the power electronics. We need the power electronics components. Means solar energy will never work without power electronics. So, and you can see the price of the solar has been significantly drops from now we're talking about almost 20 cent per watt significantly drop and that's because the market size has significantly increased and that's actually encouraged more people to to install solar and if you look into the current photovoltaic systems you can see all of them they need power electronics you see these are the all the power electronics components these are all the power electronics so what does this mean means photovoltaic systems or PV or solar will never work without power electronics. Now, you can see here also the same. We always have an inverter or a converter, you see. This is an inverter here. So these are, if you look into also another configuration here, these are the DC-DC the converters, the inverters, inverters here, inverters here. So you can see that most, 100% oh, of all the uh, solar uh, installations require power electronics in order for it to function. The same thing goes for the wind power. If you look into the wind power also, there is an increase year after year. Okay. It's an exponential increase. 
And if you look, also there is a lot of research on the on the types of uh, wind turbines. You can see this is a horizontal design, horizontal access wind turbines. But nowadays there is a lot of research on the on the vertical vertical wind turbines. And these vertical wind, wind turbines are very suitable for for rooftop because these types of wind turbines. Uh, the horizontal one introduces a lot of vibration to the building structure. It's not suitable for our buildings, but this is, can be used for rooftops. Okay, the, the vertical axis wind turbines. And if you look inside the wind turbines, you also can see there's a lot of pyrotronics. If you look into this, it's a lot of pyrotronics. This is a pyrotronics. This is pyrotronics. So also, you can see that most of, uh, okay, the uh, uh, wind applications actually requires pyrotronics. So this is for renewables. Let's look into our energy supply, the current energy supply and the current loads that we use. If you look into our current uh, loads, you look into our fridge. Now, when you go and purchase a fridge, they will ask you, you know, do you want uh, uh, an inverter based fridge or a conventional fridge? What does it mean inverter? It means there is an inverter inside the fridge. And that inverter actually helps to reduce the energy consumption. When you go and purchase a TV, they will ask you, this is an LCD, this is an LED TV. What does it mean an LED? It means an LED needs an LED driver, it means it needs a power electronics. When you go also the light bulbs, the same things. They will ask you an LED or a conventional bulb. So the LED means needs a power electronics. When you go and purchase a motor, for example, especially for factories, okay, factories. So you need a VSD, variable speed drive, or variable frequency drive. Variable frequency drive is a power electronics. Looks into robots, industries, phone chargers. It's all power electronics. So you can see, uh, almost 100% of our load, it's a power electronics. So it's all dependent on paratronics. This is from the load side. Let's look into the generation side. Generation side also wind, like we said just now, we need the paratronics. Uh, if we have electric vehicle, we need the paratronics. We have solar, we need the paratronics. Fuel cell, we need the paratronics. Means storage, we need the paratronics. So you can see actually in our energy supply system, the, the power electronics components are increasing significantly. And the idea of this, why I, it's not because I'm doing paratronics, but this is the fact what we are living today. Okay, when you see I, I have a phone charger, what is a phone charger? Phone charger, it's you, you have what inside you have a, a transformer and then you have a rectifier. What is a rectifier? It's a paratronics. So the idea of the if of of using paratronics in helping reducing the emission level, if for example, like let me give you an, a small example. Mm, that takes uh, uh, air conditioning system, for example, an air conditioning system. When you purchase an air conditioning, they will tell you this is a, an inverter base, this is a normal aircon. So when you buy the aircon, the inverter based aircon, so you can save a lot of energy. When you save, for example, like assume you save only 100 watts per month. So multiply that 100 watts by how many aircons in Malaysia, for example. How many aircons we have in Malaysia? We have millions of air conditioning systems. Multiply around the globe how many aircons we have. And you can see how much energy we can save. The same thing goes for TV. So the same thing goes for a light bulb. The same thing goes for appliances. So this is the, 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 the significant, um, what you call, uh, of introducing or incorporating power electronics into our loads and also into our generations. So the, this is, I already mentioned just now. So if you look into our uh, generation systems, we have, uh, uh, for example, wind, we have solar, we have uh, all of them, they need to be interfaced through power electronics. This is what we call a grid interface, which is a, requ a requirement. And this is just a, an example of the HVDC networks in Europe, where it connects Europe with Africa. So we have wind turbines that are connected from the offshores, and then we need all these power electronics devices, you know, to interface either from the load side or from the grid side or from the wind power plants. Storage also, when you have storage, we, we also need the, the power electronics 
to to work. Yeah. So maybe uh, uh, how much time I have? Eh? I, I I don't know. I forgot. Please let me know how much time left. Is the MC around? Hello. Hello. Prof. Saad. Yes. Hello. Uh, you have yeah. until 10.45, Prof. Saad. So how much minutes left now? Uh, means uh, 15 minutes more. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah so, no problem. Thank you. So what we, let me give you an example of uh, how uh, power electronics can help actually. So in 2012, okay, this is just uh, some statistics, you know, some, um, In 2012, okay, we consumed around 20,000 trillion watt of electricity. Okay, so the total uh, electricity consumption uh, in 2012, it estimated around 20,000 trillion watts, which is almost 40%, 40% only. So actually another 60%, it's still non-electric. Means what does it mean? Non-electric means we're talking about transportation sector, for example. Transportation sector is almost 100% is a non-electric. Means it's still dependent on the conventional uh, sources. Uh, you talk about, uh, for example, industries. Okay, there are a lot of industries still depend on gas and still depends on other conventional sources. You talk about, uh, for example, uh, construction sector. Also, the same things. Uh, only 40% of our energy actually is electric in 2012. It's, this number has increased now. So let me give you what does means 20,000 trillion watt hour. Okay, what does this mean 20,000 trillion watt hour? 20,000 trillion watt hour, if we take this uh, nuclear power plant, this one, one nuclear power plant usually they come in the size of one gigawatt. Usually the size is plus or minus one gigawatt. Most of them around the world are uh, one gigawatt. So one nuclear power plants of one gigawatt can generate up to seven trillion watt hour of electricity per year. So if we divide 20,000 by seven, then we know how many nuclear power plants. So it is estimated around, maybe around, yeah, it's not exact, but it's around 3,000 nuclear power plants. So what we consume of electricity in 2012 it's equivalent to what's been generated by 3,000 nuclear power plants. It's, it's a huge, actually. It is something which is uh, uh, really huge. Okay, so this is just an analogy. So for you, I will use this analogy throughout the, the presentation, so easy for you to, to understand. So one nuclear power plant, one gigawatt, can generate seven trillion watt hour of electricity. So in 2012, we consumed around 3,000, uh, what is generated by 3,000 nuclear power plants. So, so if we look into that 40%, okay, the 40% just now, this, this, this 40%, this 40%, we break it down. So we will bring down this uh, into where this actually, this consumption. So if we break it down, actually, you, we found that almost 65%, or almost 60%, it's consumed by motors. So, so yeah, because motors cannot run with uh, with the gas or cannot run with um, with uh, oil or cannot run with the petrol. You know, they run only with electricity. And uh, especially, especially for industrial, this is global. Eh? Even in Malaysia, also we are around that figure. We have done this study last time for TNB. And we found actually electricity consumption, see, almost 60% is consumed by industrial sector, which is motors. Okay. Uh, IT, when we see IT here, we're talking about laptops, desktops, uh, data centers, uh, all, all that, you know, uh, cloud, comp uh, cloud storage, and so on and so forth. Lights, yeah, lights, another uh, big percentage, and others. Others means like, uh, others means like uh, home appliances, like uh, kettles, uh, oven. Uh, cooking and so on and so forth it means there are other other components 
So if we just improve one, uh, if for example, if we take a 1% one per, one efficiency improvement here, we're talking not by 10%, we're talking only 1% efficiency improvement. If we do 1% efficiency improvement, we can save almost equivalent to 160 trillion watt hour of electricity. And what is 160 trillion is equivalent to what is generated by 23 nuclear power plants. It's a huge amount of saving. Okay. So, so uh, our homes nowadays are becoming uh, very um, uh, intelligent. So we have uh, our home become a generator and also they can uh, supply and also receive energy, you can sell and two ways or on the rooftop. So usually we have, uh, sometimes we have solar panels and then we have uh, some wind, we have uh, electric car, we have storage system. So we can sell and buy electricity from the grid whenever we want. Okay, so this is the thing. So what is the current situation? So well, the current situation is like this. Usually what we have, we have the grid, for example, in Malaysia, we have TMB, and then we have solar, our solar systems. We have wind, we have storage, we have electric cars. So most of the time, what we do, we have solar, we have solar what do we do? We do conversion from DC, because solar is DC, from DC to DC, and then from DC to AC, and then we connect to the grid. Wind, we do from AC to DC, from the generator to DC, and then from DC to AC, DC to, and then back to, to AC, and that's actually conversion stages. So the same thing was for battery storage from DC to DC, DC to AC. And we can see this every conversion stage, as we know, according to second thermodynamic law, you know, energy does not, we cannot destroy it. We cannot um, create it with energy just transform from one form to another form. So when we convert, automatically there are losses. There is no such converter that's 100% efficient. Always, maybe the best will be around 98% efficiency. So every conversion, you lose 2%. Every conversion, you lose 2%. So you can see the amount of losses that happens in the systems. Okay? So this is the current system. So we can see this a lot. And when we want to use it, for example, for an LED, we convert back to DC. So it comes from DC. For example, from solar is DC. And then it goes to AC and then go back to DC again. The same thing goes for washing machines, for fridge, for cookers, for everything. Lights and LED lights and so on and so forth. So these conversions happens in a few stages and that's actually introduced a lot of losses inside the system. So what will happen if we, re we remove all this AC and then we put a DC bus, a normal DC bus, then we remove all these converters. See, instead of two converters, we already have only one. Instead of two, we only have one. Instead of two, we have only one. So we reduce, means we are improving the efficiency at least by 2% and in each connection. IT. Okay, if we look into IT, that's one of the very now most common or most usable devices that we, we in the market. We have a lot of computers, desktops, laptops, and so on and so forth. So if we only do improvement of 1% efficiency, we can save almost what is equivalent to 20 trillion watt hour, which is equivalent to three nuclear power plants. Yeah, and this we see it every day. We have servers, data centers, uh, laptops and desktops. And um, uh, I don't know, we have time to show this or not. This is the evolution of the, of the microprocessors from the 404 up to what you call i7 and i9 nowadays. Let me, I think I will escape this. Let me show you, yeah, let me show you this. Yeah, uh, I think we use this one very commonly. Most of our uh, laptops have this kind of charger. Uh, Sorry, to charging... Sorry to you have three minutes okay. and five minutes. La la. Three minutes to finish, and okay. then later so we have I, a I will minutes, okay. So if we have this, we have this charger, laptop chargers, you know, and uh, this charger usually come between 8.7 to 19 volts. And then when it goes to the computer, then we have all this VR. VR is the voltage regulators, okay? And uh, then it goes to the uh, to the main, for example, go to the CPU, goes to the graphic, to the RAM, to the hard disk, the LCD, because they, all of them have different voltage levels. That's why we have voltage regulators. 
So you, see, you can see how many conversions, mini conversion stages. And each conversion, there are losses, okay? And this is what's been used in, um, in these battery charges. You know, usually we use this uh, flyback topology, which is using a hard switching. What we, what we have been done, we have changed this one to soft switching, okay? We use a soft switching, so the, we got a better waveforms. Let me show you the impact. This is the impact. The, the peak efficiency in 2009 was around 85% of these charges, the peak efficiency, yeah? okay? And this efficiency has improved to 96%. Within a huh? few years, sorry, within almost four years, just by changing the, 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 the topology from hard switching to soft switching, which is the power electronics. We introduced some uh, inductors and capacitors to, to switch the, the flyback at uh, zero voltage and zero current. Uh, then this is the amount of efficiency improvement. You can see the amount of efficiency, like take, like take it optimum 10% only. For example, 10%. 10% efficiency improvement, multiply it by the number of charges we have around the globe. How many laptops we have? How many desktops we have? How many tablets we have? How many phones we have? You can see this, uh, within this, almost we save what is generated by almost 60 nuclear power plants. And just look at it. If we do further modifications, for example, data centers, <laughs> if we move from the conventional data centers to DC data centers, which already started now by Google, light, into the light, if we switch from the normal bulbs to this to this, we can save almost four times, almost 20%. So we can say almost what is generated by 450 nuclear power Motos, which is the largest part, we can save almost by just putting the VSD or variable speed drives, we can save almost what is generated by 300 nuclear power plants. Maybe I will stop here. And then maybe I open for questions. If you have any questions or any comments or any suggestions, please. Thank you, Prof. We're going to have another five minutes for uh, question and answer session before we uh, before we proceed with another session. Thank you. So, if anyone have any question, you can raise it now. We have allocated five minutes for this question and uh, question and answer sessions. We have Nabila. Uh, is it Mr. Kasi? Oh yeah, Mr. Kasi. Yeah. Good morning, Prof. Yeah, good morning. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one clarification. Yeah. For solar panels, uh, is it the multi junction cells are available nowadays? Yeah, yeah. Uh, multi junction solar cells are available, but usually they are very expensive. They are usually for used for uh, space applications. Okay, okay. Uh, for uh, very uh, niche applications, not for. Um, for normal one, normal one, we still use the single junction solar cells because of the cost implications. Monocrystalline. Yeah, it's the, the most one is the monocrystalline. Depends on the locations. We have the monocrystalline, we have the thin film, and then we have the polycrystallines. Oh, okay. Usually, the monocrystallines has the highest efficiency compared to others. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Thank you, Prof. Another clarification. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, vertical axis turbines having uh, less vibrations compared to horizontal. Uh, uh, what is the range of the uh, power generation for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we have the, the, as I said just now, because we in the cities, because, you know, the, the concept now, we usually when we build the buildings, we just build the buildings, right? Yes. Blocks, one block after block. But nowadays, buildings need to generate a part of its energy. So, for example, you build a building, you have as an architect or as designer, how much this building can generate of the energy? The building itself has to generate energy. Means by installing, maybe instead of putting uh, window glasses, you put solar panels. And on the top, maybe this building is a high rise, you know? And as we know, as we go higher, the wind speed increases. Yes, yes. So 
that's actually the introduction. But uh, unfortunately, this uh, this type of limit turbines, the power is not very high. We're talking about maybe one kilowatt, two kilowatt. But if you have few, for example, ten or twenty, then you have around twenty kilowatt generated. And the good things about the wind is not dependent on the on day or night. It can be running twenty four hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bro. Thank you. If any other questions, any other questions that you want to ask, we still have another two minutes before the session ends. Uh, good morning, Doctor. Yes, good morning. Uh, yes, just now you were talking about uh, nuclear power plants and mm. they are used in generation of uh, electricity. Mm. I wanted to ask that, do you foresee in the future the applications of Internet of Things with the nuclear power plants? And what roles can uh, IoT be applied in in nuclear power plants? In what areas? I, uh, I think I think for the the nuclear power nuclear energy or nuclear power plant for electricity generation, it's already a metro technology. You know, there are many countries around the world which are dependent almost, like France, for example. France, sixty percent of the electricity generation is from nuclear. And uh, maybe the IoT things can be used in um, improving the, uh, the safety of this nuclear power plant. I think this is one of the areas where um, uh, this IoT can be used in improving the, if the safety. And, uh, but in terms of technology, it's a very mature technology and it's, uh, it's proven to be safe, uh, except uh, there are a few very exceptional cases which happens. <laughs> this is maybe one of the areas. Yeah, I'm not in the in the nuclear energy, but this is my my opinion. You know. Okay, doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I think thank you. Ahmed. Ahmed has raised his hand. Ahmed and. Uh, oh, Ahmed Nawaf. I think we can let that one as the last question for today. Uh, Nawaf. Today. Uh, Nawaf. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, Professor Saad, you mentioned before that uh, the Q cell, I believe, like one big cell can uh, provide the, the world with the solar panel power, right? Yes. Uh, Don't no, you think that it will be expensive to generate? Uh, no, I mentioned, I mentioned. No, what I have mentioned, Sorry? I say the Q cell, Q cell, no, it's a solar manufacturer. Q -cell, Q -cell, it's a solar manufacturer. Oh, they have done studies. Yes, but Based don't you? Uh, they have done studies. Based on that. Yes, please continue. Yeah. So what I, what I, what I presented in the Sorry. slide. Yeah. So what I, what the slide what that the the Q cell they have done a study. They have manufactured the solar cells at the efficiency of fifteen point five percent, and they say if we install this amount of solar panels of this type of solar panels in the desert of Algeria and or Libya or that African North African countries, will be enough to supply the whole world of electricity. But as I say. Maybe this is just a promotion. It's like commercial uh, advertisements. For me, for example, let's multiply it by five or six times. It's still uh, something which we need to think of. Yeah. Please proceed. Yeah. But Please proceed. Professor, don't you think that it will be expensive to generate and transmit and distribute the, this uh, amount of power around the world? And do you think this idea is applicable? Yeah. And all this uh, yeah. power you mentioned, yeah. is it included the industries, yeah. the industries or only houses? Yeah, uh, the, the current, just to let you know, the current, um, the, current, uh, the current price or the current cost of electricity generated from solar is similar to the one generated by the, the conventional sources nowadays, today. The cost of electricity generated from solar is same as the cost generated from the conventional sources. This is one. Yeah, to transmit this energy, Yes, we can generate this energy in one location and then we need to transmit it to all the parts of the world. Yes, that I agree with you. There should be an investment in the infrastructure. Also using the existing infrastructure. Yeah, to transmit this amount of power, you need to build the new cables, maybe a very high power, uh, high voltage DC cables that link, for example, Africa with Europe, Europe with Asia, and maybe under the, what I call the Atlantic between um, Europe and uh, America, between Latin America and Africa, yes, there will be some uh, investment in the infrastructure. That's the same thing happens in the internet. 
you know, there's a lot of submarine cables uh, that's for data, and that can be the same thing could done for power. And that should be, yeah, it's an investment, but uh, the technology has already uh, proven and it's already commercially and um, practically available. I'll give you an example, uh, Denmark. Denmark have already reached almost 50% of electricity they use is from wind turbines, 50%. And they want to reach to 100%. So what does this mean? Means that wind, yeah, because Denmark, they have good wind speed there. So means the wind is proven to be a very reliable technology to supply the, the whole country. And that happens. And the cost a very important factor, but the cost has significantly dropped. And as I say, for example, for wind, for solar, for all of them now, they are very competitive and the same level as conventional sources. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Unfortunately, with a restriction amount of time, we cannot accept any other questions because we need to proceed with the parallel sessions. However, uh, we are so thankful for Prof. Dr. Saad for his speech. Um, for Prof. Dr. Saad, we are actually preparing uh, the e-certificate for you. It will be presented in the screen. It's a token of appreciation to, from Masa. Sharing, right? uh, excuse me? I have to stop sharing, right? Uh, yeah, you should stop sharing because we want to share. We would like to share uh, the screen now. Uh, so this is the ECTVK for token of appreciation from Masa to you. Uh, we are going to be sending to you, Awasa, we send you to. We would like to thank you for your time here you spend with us and sharing your information, sharing your knowledge, and I hope that everyone will be benefited from his talk. And we hope that in future, maybe we can collaborate together if any possibilities. Thank you yes, again, sir. Prof. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. So thank you. for everyone else, now is the parallel session. All of you have your respected links that you need to go for presenters. You can go to your respected links as well as, as, well as uh, the one who wants to uh, join the presentations. And we will uh, be having another keynote session presented by Mr. Sunil David, Regional Director of IOT, uh, AT&T Chennai India at 2 p.m. So uh, at 2 p.m. you can come back to this link to watch the second keynote session. Now, you can go to your parallel session with your respective link. I also wish for all presenters good luck and do your best and see you around 2 p.m. Thank you. So we reach our evening keynote session. Uh, before this, we have our second first part of the parallel sessions. And now we reach the second uh, keynote sessions. And this keynote is going to be delivered by our second speaker, which is Mr. Sunil David. He is a regional director of IOT, at and Chennai, India. Uh, I will tell you a bit of biography of Mr. Sunil. Mr. Sunil David is currently working as the regional director, IOT for at and India in Chennai. He has 26, 26 years of experience in IT and telecom industry and is responsible for building the IOT strategy for India and the Asian region. He worked with various internal, internal stakeholders to ensure successful executions, working on building a robust partner ecosystem for at and in entire IoT value chain. Mrs. Tunil was given India's fastest growing leaders pride of the nation award 2019-2020. He also written many articles related to smart cities, IR 4.0, digital transformation, Destructive technology, 5G, IoT security for leading B2B. He also has spoken at more than 50 industry forums in India and abroad organized by leading industry bodies like COAI, CII, IA, MAI, and many more. So we are proud to have Mr. Sunil David here with us to give his speech. And the keynote speech is the, the title of the keynote speech is AI and IoT for societal impact and enabling the sustainable future. Please welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Rashidi, for that introduction and uh, a warm welcome uh, to all those who have joined us virtually. Good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are. 
i hope all of you all are staying safe and healthy i would also like to thank uh, professor satik and the mahasa university team for giving me the opportunity to to deliver this presentation i'm just going to open my slide deck Just give me a minute. I'm just trying to open my. Can you all see my screen? No. This is Sunil. We can't see the screen. Ah, okay. Now coming up. Can you all see it? Yes. Now can. Ah, uh, is it in a presentation format? Yes, it is. It's, yeah, it's a full screen format. Okay, okay, great. Thank you so much for confirming that. So, uh, the topic that I've chosen for today is AI and IoT for societal impact and enabling a sustainable future. And this is something which is very close to my heart. So, while today you know we can use technology for the benefit of enterprises, for consumers, making life easy for all of us and convenient for all of us, I think what is also very very important is how you can use technology like ai iot and other technologies like blockchain etc which really can touch lives of people which can enable a sustainable future uh, and uh, you know talking about touching lives i wanted to first start by sharing an example of uh, of a school in a place called uh, telangana state in in india uh, you must have heard of hyderabad a well known city and uh, this is about 40 kilometers away from hyderabad in telangana state and the school i'm just showing you pictures of some uh, of a school here uh, and this is all before the pandemic has hit us now this particular school is a primary school and uh, they had of course uh, you know children coming to the school now what happened was that this school was completely cut off from the electricity grid there was no there was no power actually that was available for this particular school and because of which they were actually not able to get you know the students to come and attend the school so what they did is they installed solar panels and you can see that in the picture on the left side below uh, solar panels were installed so that they can actually capture solar energy and that would enable a few lights and fans and other gadgets to work in the school but um, solar power is obviously not on, uh, you know it has its own limitations especially when it's raining and when there's no sunlight uh, you can generate solar energy but not enough for storage so you obviously need some kind of a backup in case solar power is not available and i just wanted to share an example of how a very young indian woman her name is dr rashi gupta uh, well known in india uh, one of asia's well known uh, technologists in the renewable renewable energy space so what she did is she came up with one solution which is a you know which is called an iot in one box so this is a energy storage solution that integrates various functions it works as an inverter it's got a maximum power point tracking and it's also got a lithium battery so this is actually used as a backup just in case you know their solar power is insufficient and this is uh, remotely monitored using iot technology so they can actually monitor the current the voltage uh, the state of charge etc uh, remotely and this is a wonderful solution uh, where you can monitor you know remotely where you can manage energy and this also very seamlessly integrates with the smart grid so i just wanted to share this example of how uh, using technology one can actually touch lives of people and thanks to this uh, you had the students coming back to schools of course this is all pre pandemic but students started coming back to schools because there was uninterrupted power solar power with the uh, you know this iot in one box as a backup you know so uh, a wonderful example again you know of how it can really impact lives now talking about uh, how technology can be used for the good of consumers and societies Uh, there are definitely various potential social and environmental benefits and there are a number of areas where one can use uh, you know technology It could be in the area of water conservation i'm going to give some examples later emission reduction patient care air quality being much more cleaner uh, i think that is so so critical in today's times better health 
how do you manage resources because today we are constrained in terms of resources some of the resources that we have be it water be it uh, oil uh, is all you know we at some point in time we might probably face challenges where you know we may not have enough of that and it becomes very important to manage those resources very efficiently uh, how do you manage waste that's again a big challenge worker safety you know so all of these uh, you know can be solved using technology now uh, i just wanted to highlight um, at and at and the the us based telecom services provider and uh, been with them for close to 27 years now and and we as a company you know uh, have set a goal where we want to enable carbon savings that are 10 times the footprint of our operations uh, so that it can enhance the efficiency of our network we are in the business of providing connectivity and thereby we deliver sustainable customer solutions and this whole commitment to inspire human progress is something which is very close to the uh, the heart of our chairman and like at&t there are many more companies big and small uh, where sustainability is the fundamental for success so all of these companies have uh, very clear goals esg goals environmental social and government uh, um, and governance goals right and uh, there are some data points which i wanted to share here where 90% of ceos says the sustainability is fundamental for success and many ceo cxos their 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 salaries their incentives are actually tied to their company meeting these esg goals many companies have set targets again uh, you know 732 companies globally have set clear emission reduction targets that are very science based for so reducing carbon right less uh, emission of carbon because that is a major contributor uh, to the environmental degradation that we are currently seeing uh, investors have also poured in 41 trillion in assets so what we also started to see is uh, you know private equity whether it is uh, other investors are are you know rewarding those companies who have clearly spelled out clear esg goals because the whole objective is to reduce emissions and what we have also seen is that um, 84% of existing iot deployments today can address the un sustainable development goals and i think uh, you may be aware of the un sustainable development goals there are 17 of them that they came up with uh, and with the you know with an agenda of to come you know to meet most of them by 2030 very quickly sharing some of those goals uh, not all of them but uh, some of the goals are like no poverty no hunger quality education gender equality affordable and clean energy reducing inequalities sustainable cities and communities and i'm going to talk about that a little later climate action and so on and so forth so there are clear goals that un came up with and the onus is on the industry now to see how they can meet or come close to meeting those goals so i'm going to start uh, by sharing some examples of how technology can be used in industry uh, and i'm going to start with manufacturing because uh, today uh, a study was done a few years back which said that heavy industry is responsible for one third of global greenhouse gas emissions so emission of co2 emission of methane Uh, emission of nitrous oxide all these are very very harmful for environment and if you just look at all the factories the big and large factories and some of the smaller factories today uh, today we started to see a lot more deployment of technology right so the whole adoption of industry 4.0 where you're going to have uh, robots in factories working along with humans uh, where you use a lot more technology to monitor all these industrial assets which are there right so whether it is factory flow connectivity and 5g is definitely going to be play a big part in that uh where you could remotely uh you know thanks to 5g you can actually train people how to manage a shop floor how to manage machines you can actually do remote inspection and maintenance today thanks to 5g uh you know powered by iot um, and and also you know it can have reduces travel time energy and resource use right so uh, a lot of use cases today within a factory uh, where you can use technology so be it remote monitoring of machines or even energy management because a lot of these industrial assets a lot of these machines boilers pumps uh, a lot of these equipment today are energy guzzlers they use a lot of energy and today you can actually use iot enabled devices that can monitor these assets in real time and you can actually optimize energy usage right and uh, when you optimize energy usage obviously it has an impact on co2 emission secondly um, and again this is very very important today you can use video and intelligence so you can have you know you can leverage existing cctv cameras or you can add uh, you know high resolution um, video sensors that can monitor what is going on 
inside the factory. So, for, for example, if the workers inside are wearing personal protection equipment, uh, whether they are adhering to all the safety standards in the factory, and even things like defect and waste reduction. For example, uh, when you are having, uh, you know, uh, on the conveyor belt in a factory, when you have all these uh, equipment going in production of equipment which is happening, whatever it could be a car, it could be um, any industrial equipment. Sometimes what happens is that the human eye cannot detect a defect in that in that in that machine. And thanks to very high resolution cameras, they can actually detect it. So using combination of computer vision and AI, one can actually detect any quality issues. And that actually reduces a lot of waste because just imagine if you have a product which is not properly detected from a quality standpoint, if that goes out, um, you know, and shipped, uh, you know, just imagine the cost involved in trying to do a recall, right? So you can actually save all that cost by using AI enabled computer vision. Waste reduction, a lot of uh, waste gets generated that again can be optimized. You can reduce it, you can't eliminate it, but you can definitely reduce it. And thanks to technology that is possible. Uh, talking about, uh, you know, large buildings, you know, again, you know, it could be the big buildings, could be small buildings, residential complexes, commercial complexes. Uh, today, you can use um, IoT enabled solutions that can optimize energy usage. Again, there was some study which was done, which said that, 30% of energy consumed, consumed in commercial buildings today is wasted. So how do you reduce that wastage, right? So facility managers today, they build what is called building management systems, especially among the old buildings, uh, but those have certain challenges. So today what you can do is, you can use IoT sensors and building management systems in combination uh, to track pretty much every asset that is used in a building, especially things like heating, ventilation, and air conditioning because the air conditioning generates a lot of power and you can actually uh, optimize AC usage, right? So for example, the chillers which are there, uh, you know, uh, which are connecting to the ACs, you know, you can actually monitor the chillers um, and, and a lot of the other assets which are there in any building. Uh, you can all, you can mo monitor that remotely. And we as an at and uh, we have more than 350 facilities. And this is an example, which is in the US, but this is very much replicable across many other countries. Uh, we have about 350 facilities in the US and we have about 27,000 pieces of equipment. And thanks to uh, IoT based sensors that are connected to all of that, and we built our own energy management system, we are able to monitor this. And uh, we actually been able to see significant savings in terms of our um, energy consumption. For example, uh, 925,000 in, in annualized savings as far as electricity use, uh, we've been able to reduce 9 million kilowatt hour and, and most importantly, saving of 5,150 metric tons of carbon dioxide, so less COT emission, right? That is equivalent to like 580,000 gallons of gas, gas right? So a uh, lot of buildings today, uh, you know, is ripe for using these kind of solutions, IoT enabled solutions, which can actually optimize energy usage. That will go a long way in reducing carbon emission. Uh, also wanted to share examples in retail, you know, so for example, uh, uh, again, a study which was done by uh, uh, Retail Industries Lenders Association, uh, which said that 93% of global consumers today expect more of the brands that they use to support social and environmental issues. Again, technology will play a big part here, you know, so whether it is retail or hospitality, uh, you can actually drive better, better productivity and improve CX customer experience. At the same time, you're trying to keep your employees and customers safe. And again, use of uh, technology here. So simple examples, for example, uh, you can use what's called Bluetooth low energy and LTE, uh, cellular connectivity, to provide specific micro location data of people where they are, uh, right? And you can actually enhance and, uh, safety and security of hospitality workers. It could be in large retail outlets or it could be in hospitals, any public places. I also wanted to give you some examples here of uh, how, uh, you know, IoT has actually enabled retail automation. And I wanted to give an example of a company called BrainCorp. And again, this is a, while this is a US example, this is very much possible to be used a, a, pretty much in any other country. Um, now this company called BrainCorp, they make autonomous mobile robots. And, uh, and, and especially during the COVID situation, this came in very handy because you didn't really want people uh, going to the retail outlets, hospitals to do all this cleaning. Right, so you actually had these mo mobile robots which are going in and and you know cleaning uh, the floors and uh, you know, completely autonomously. So you have IoT devices which are attached to this, 
and you can actually remotely monitor this you can monitor its movement you can do maintenance remotely right so uh, you know very good example of how you can uh, use technology you know for the for the for the, for the benefit of the retail industry and uh, secondly i wanted to give another example of a company called lowes uh, you know they are a well known um, home improvement store uh, they sell building supplies paint home decor and all that and all of these stores uh, they have about 939 stores in the us and um, they have you know these landscapes every store has huge landscapes and they use a lot of water to maintain that landscape and here we actually worked with them to uh, you know optimize water usage so for example there used to be leaks which were happening earlier so we are able to plug those leaks thanks to iot sensors which are connected and we could monitor the flow of water and thanks to you know the deployment of this technology uh, they were able to save about 5 million and 650 million gallons of water savings and that resulted in an emission saving equivalent of 884000 gallons of gas so you can see the you know the impact right so when you reduce uh, use of water uh, it also has an impact in terms of reducing pumps because you using pumps to move water from say uh, the from one point to the other and when you reduce less pump uh, yeah, you, when you reduce the usage of the pump uh, you also actually save on co2 emissions so you kind of see that impact which it has um another area where you can actually use technologies energy and utilities and um, again a study which was done which showed that smart energy can bring huge environmental savings saving up to 6.3 billion megawatt hour by 2030 now if you just look at uh, this whole energy and utility sector right from the time from the point where power gets generated right so the generation of power and then you have all these transmission and distribution lines which are carrying this power which are then going uh eventually and then terminating to all these transformers you know you have these transformers that you have seen uh which steps down the voltage from higher voltage to lower voltage and then these transformers are then finally used uh to eventually deliver a uh, power uh to you know to to, to to various commercial buildings um and also residential buildings right now in, in this whole area right from generation to transmission and distribution one can actually use technology here now let's start with the grid you know so you can actually use a smart grid where you can actually monitor the generation of power right and and lot of the transmission and distribution equipment uh, they are actually uh, you know there there's a lot of loss which actually happens you know so for example in india uh, almost 20 to 22% 22 to 24% of losses occur during transmission and distribution and you can actually use uh, technology to reduce those losses we cannot eliminate it but you can actually reduce those losses right because it's a loss of revenue for the uh, you know the power generating companies right there so much of loss so you can track at at a very at a grid level you can actually use technology to monitor the generation transmission distribution and even transformers you know so for example you can have transformers today uh, which can be remotely monitored and many times the power outages that we face today are because of uh, faulty transformers and it takes time for someone to come and fix a transformer right so thanks to and i've actually been involved in a project a couple of years back where we worked with a company to monitor these transformers remotely so monitoring the earthing of the transformer monitoring uh, you know the voltage etc you can remotely monitor that and uh, and and even before the transformer fails uh, you know you get an alert saying that there could be a potential failure and you can attempt to troubleshoot it remotely and you send the person to the to the field only when you really need to do a physical inspection but transformers today can be remotely monitored and the other area where you can actually benefit is the whole use of smart metering you know um, and uh, and again i wanted to give an example here in india where there's a big initiative to replace conventional meters with smart meters so the government had launched what is called a smart meter national program where we have about 250 conventional meters where someone has to somebody from the electricity board has to go to every residential home and every home has got a meter and they have to physically go and make a reading a note of the reading you know how many energy uh, how much of consumption of energy units right they have to physically make a note of it and the consumers would get an alert uh, either an sms or an email and then they have to make that payment now this can be completely automated right so you can actually replace these conventional meters with smart meters so all of these smart meters would have cellular sims inside it iot sims and it will it will monitor the energy consumption in your home so every gadget that you use especially some of the ones which generate a lot of power 
or you uh, energy for example air conditioners or microwave oven so it will monitor all the consumption of all these gadgets and as a consumer using an app i can get real time consumption of all my uh, you know uh, gadgets at home and if i know that i'm i'm you know spending i'm using a lot more energy i can try to optimize the usage right so obviously i don't want to pay very high power bills right so this is a massive project which is underway where uh, smart meters are going to be deployed across india and this is again you know uh, uh, in fact there are other countries which are also a lot more advanced in terms of using these smart meters uh, uh, coming to uh, transportation and uh, and this is an area where again you know uh, technology can be widely used you know just imagine the logistics sector you know uh, the logistics cost uh, for most countries uh, at the percentage of gdp is anywhere between 8 to 14% and if a country is able to reduce their logistics cost it actually improves their competitiveness as a manufacturing hub right um, uh, so and if you just look at the logistics uh, which is part of supply chain uh, there are important components of uh, logistics right so one is you wanting to track all the assets which are moving from one point to the other right it's moving from a port to the nearest distribution center and finally to the end consumer and there's also the need to track the fleet right so you have all these vehicles Uh, which are moving cargo from one point to the other right so today you have uh, solutions uh, for example you can have a telematics device uh, which has the required sensors which can connect to you know all these vehicles so for example you can monitor uh, you know the driver behavior you know a lot of the accidents happen because uh, uh, the drivers are not driving properly and so they need to track how the drivers drive are they braking correctly are they accelerating well uh sometimes some of these drivers uh, are on um, you know they travel uh, they drive for very very long hours and and it's bound to happen where someone might just doze off and that obviously can lead to an accident and today you can have cameras which are attached inside which can track the eyelid movement you know whether his eyes are closing off and all that and immediately an alert goes and a cell phone vibrates and he is woken uh, woken up right so uh, technology is available to do that you can also have track fuel consumption so uh, again a challenge today um, in india is fuel pilferage uh, when you have these vehicles going on the highways a lot of the fuel is getting pilferaged and that you can actually use technology to ensure that it doesn't happen you know if someone tries to tamper with the fuel tank uh, an alert goes and they know that somebody is trying to tamper with it right so you can actually use technology today uh, to improve driver safety uh, improve productivity and com- compliance uh, today there is also the need Uh, there is also a possibility to use v2x vehicle to infrastructure you know uh, uh, where you can have autonomous vehicles that can be going in in controlled environments in controlled environments you can have i'm not talking about using autonomous vehicles in 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 the in the streets of a city uh, we are still a few years away from that but in controlled environments you can actually use for example it could be in a large um, warehouse um, it could be in a large factory where you can have autonomous vehicles that you can remotely monitor then um, uh the other important thing is that uh, uh, when you are using the technology to monitor fuel uh, uh, you know uh, on a real time basis you can actually optimize fuel usage and you can also integrate with you know your uh, weather api you can integrate with the traffic management system for example if you integrate with the traffic management system you can make sure that you can use route optimization to make sure the driver takes the shortest possible route to reach the destination right so all this has an impact on environment because the less fuel you consume the less co2 that you emit right uh, now uh, we are all talking about electric vehicles right so i think that's the next big thing uh, almost every country has a clear road map in terms of manufacturing of electric vehicles and of course when you have electric vehicles it definitely helps because you're going to use uh, you know um, you're not going to use uh, the regular petrol and diesel so that definitely has an impact on environment but then you need charging infrastructure so today you have solutions where you can monitor the charging infrastructure uh, wherever there where, wherever it is and and significant savings in terms of gasoline when you use electric cars right uh, as per a study uh, an equivalent of uh, 138000 metric tons of co2 was prevented from being generated right and and all these electric cars also are connected using iot so you have telematic devices that can connect to the vehicle and uh, you can monitor its location uh, you can also monitor the battery because the battery is a very significant component of the cost of the car and uh, today people have what is called range anxiety they're not too sure 
how much of charge is there in the battery because each of these batteries come with a charge of say 100 kilometers 150 kilometers uh, so you can actually use technology where using an app or a driver would know exactly how much of charge is left right the other thing which i wanted to share is uh, this whole thing about pallets you know so today you have uh, uh, you know we use a lot of wooden pallets for packaging right so a lot of the cargo that we are stored are, are using wooden pallets now all these pallets are definitely not good for environment and many of these wooden pallets uh, cannot be reused and uh, so we worked with this company called rm2 which is based in uk uh, where they are actually making pallets made out of composite materials so they are also trying to optimize the packaging you know trying to reduce the pallet height weight and also make it easy to repair and replace uh, these pallets and so so we worked with this uh, company uh, to 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 you know to monitor these pallets in real time so there is iot sensors that are fused into these pallets where you can monitor uh, these pallets in real time you know the location of the pallet where it is and and thanks to this um, again you know it had an impact on environment you know uh, where uh, we were able to reduce uh, carbon emission to the extent of 640 tons and uh, you know uh, 5.5 times more trips before repair and repair and replacement so you saved less the lesser number of trips that were needed so again you know a good example of how um, technology can be used especially in the logistics sector especially when it relates to fleet management asset tracking etc so now coming to healthcare uh, healthcare i think there are enough and more use cases where you can actually use uh, technology so um, the global demand for iot in healthcare will reach 534 odd billion by 2025 as per a study now you can today use technology to monitor patients uh, remotely um, uh, remote monitoring especially in the covid situation when people are not wanting to go physically to a hospital or meet a doctor uh, today you thanks to technology today high speed networks uh, doctors can actually track your vitals you can wear a smart wearable and you can track your vitals uh, it will also help in your diagnosis you can do remote video calling with the doctors right um, again you can use technology today uh, wherein you can sanitize Uh, rooms. If for some reason you have no choice but to go to the hospital, today you can use technology to sanitize those rooms. And here I wanted to give you the example of a company called Zenex, uh, which uh, which is uh, again based in the US. But we are also started to see equivalent such robots, which are used in many many hospitals in the world. And what this uh, robot does is it it pulses xenon UV light, ultraviolet light. and that uv light can actually deactivate all the viruses and bacteria which are there on the surfaces and these robots are uh, you know equipped with iot devices so you can remotely monitor uh, these robots and you can also do you know maintenance of these robots remotely so you don't have to have someone physically go there and repair a robot you can do that remotely so this is again a, a good example of how um, you know hospital can actually use technology uh, uh, you know to to help in in such kind of situations um uh, there are today companies who are making connected prosthetics again a company called hanger um, which makes a connected prosthetic leg uh, now uh, you know and this is again iot enabled now when someone who has suffered an amputation uh, if they are initially trying to use a prosthetic leg uh, for a, for a body to accept a, for a for a human body to accept a foreign uh, element it takes some time you know especially those who are trying to use a prosthetic uh, leg initially it becomes very very difficult in fact a study showed that uh, after a few weeks they just don't want to use it but again you know technology can come in handy you can connect an iot device to that a prosthetic leg and monitor it you know when the person has removed it how many uh, how many meters he has walked all that can be tracked remotely right so and the data actually goes to a clinician and he knows exactly uh, whether the patient is actually using tell him that hey it's important that you use it to get used to that right so again you know whether it is remote patient monitoring hospital disinfection making life easy for accessibility for people who are having uh, you know uh, walking challenges technology can come in handy there uh, i want to talk about now food and agriculture uh, again you know uh, we are uh, uh, going to face some big challenge when it comes to our food security because um, uh, the population obviously is increasing and in order to cater to the increased population a lot more food needs to be generated and we have also started to see a lot of food getting wasted today right um, and technology can be definitely playing a big part when it comes to how do you you know uh, help in food and agriculture and here 
I wanted to again give an example of a study which was done where one third of the agriculture production ends up in landfills, and IoT technology can be part of the solution. Now, especially in um, you know in, in agriculture, a, a lot of water gets utilized in agriculture, right? For example, in rice cultivation, uh, rice is the staple food for many countries. Uh, every rice field has to have at least four inches of water flood, right? A lot of water actually gets wasted in in rice fields. And thanks to technology today, you can optimize water usage. And this has a, actually a cascading effect on other areas. For example, again, I wanted to give an example of a, a study of, of a, um, you know, a use case here, um, uh, where uh, we worked with a company uh, in the US. And, and again, this is very much replicable anywhere in the world, where we attached sensors to the fields, which will measure uh, you know, water levels. So this is a technique called alternate wetting and drying. So one does not need to always maintain four inches of water, right? So you have these sensors which will measure water levels. So what happens is that it will be constantly measuring the water levels. The moment you get to a stage where the field is drying up, an alert goes to the pump. It's a smart pump, which IoT, uh, which is IoT enabled, and the pump then switches on, and then water flows, right? So it, so only when there is a situation where the fields are getting dry, water is released. Um, and, and when there's enough water, obviously the pump doesn't uh, need to be used, right? So it's had you know, a big impact. One is you're reducing the uh, use of water, very judicious use of water. Number two, the pump usage also is uh, reduced. You don't constantly need to use the pump uh, because again, that generates electricity. And the more pump you use, uh, you know, the more CO2 emission happens, right? And what also happens is that uh, when you're uh, having a situation where, you know, uh, you're always flooding the field with water, it creates what is called as an anaerobic condition, anaerobic condition, where it generates a lot of methane, which is a very harmful greenhouse gas. So in actually, we can actually reduce the amount of methane, right? So whether it is optimizing use of water, spraying the right amount of pesticide and fertilizers in a field, IoT technology can be used today for that. Uh, uh, in logistics, cold chain and food safety, a lot of food gets rotted and wasted. And uh, today you can use uh, you know, IoT technology uh, uh, to, to monitor the cold chain, to make sure that everything inside that uh, in, in those warehouses are monitored from a temperature standpoint. I very quickly wanted to share an example of how IoT can be used in food waste processing. You know? So this is a company called grind to energy as I mentioned, you know, a lot of the food uh, is, uh, gets wasted, whether it is in large shopping malls, uh, residential complexes, so much of food gets wasted. And a lot of that ends up in a landfill, right? And again, that generates uh, greenhouse gas. Now, what we have done is, uh, this company called Emerson, they build an industrial grinder. So what it does is all the food waste is put into that grinder and it generates what is called as a food waste slurry. And this is actually used to generate biofuels and fertilizer. Right. So today, using IoT, you can monitor these grinders and these also these uh, you know the, uh, the amount of slurry that gets generated. Right. So this has resulted in a significant amount of saving. So 7,400 tons of food waste has not been dumped in landfills. A lot of uh, clean electricity has been generated, saving in terms of fertilizer use. Right. And it also 5,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide was avoided being emitted into the atmosphere. So again, a very good example of how we are using IoT to, 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 you know, to enable food waste processing. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but uh, we have another five minutes. Yeah, I'm just going to my last slide. And okay. I just okay. end and then my, the Q&A session. Yeah, yeah, just last slide. Uh, so in, in the public sector, for example, in smart cities, I think every country has a project uh, to have their cities um, made smart for the benefit of the citizens. So whether it is use of IoT for smart lighting, where you can track the intensity of the light, reduce it, uh, switch it off when it is not being used, whether it is in monitoring of waste. Uh, I talked about uh, water optimization. In all these areas, uh, you can actually use uh, technology and, and uh, it will only make uh, life easy for citizens. So uh, with that, um, I have ended my presentation. I hope you found this useful and happy to take questions now. Okay, thank you, sir. So we open for five minute Q and A session. Does anybody wants to ask questions? You can ask now. Does anybody want to ask any questions? 
Uh, no, Priscilla. No, no, okay. okay uh, hi, uh, Mr. Sunil. Yes. Nathan. Okay, you you was mentioning about smart meters for uh, housing, yeah. Um, is it affordable? Uh, this this using this smart meters is it affordable for the middle class family? Because we understand that uh, using this IoT technology, you know, it has the benefit in in reducing the energy consumptions. But then, how we can help this middle class families, you know, by using uh, this kind of technology? Because I think um, currently. It is expensive. We understand that using IoT technology is expensive, and um, mainly only the high-income individuals I can afford to have it. This, you know. but how we can target to help those middle-class families? Yes, I think if I understood the question right, uh, Shanti, you asked me is it affordable to use smart meters, and you're saying that IoT is expensive. So I just wanted to see. I'm an IoT evangelist, and I've seen how the cost of technology has come down. The cost of sensors are coming down significantly. The cost of connectivity is much, much lower compared to what it was before. And also the smart meters, because it's a government initiative, what they're doing is they're trying to consolidate the requirement of all the states. And that way they can get better bargaining power. And that way they're trying to reduce the cost of these smart meters. I mean, for the consumer, definitely the return on investment, even if they're going to spend something for the smart meter, they have to see the benefit in terms of savings in terms of electricity consumption, right? Because they're going to use a smart meter and that will definitely help them in monitoring their consumption in real time. So they're actually going to save on their uh, energy usage as they start using these smart meters. Otherwise, if I'm not able to track my consumption on a, on a regular basis, uh, I'll end up you know, with high energy bills and I have no way to track that, uh, Shanti. But definitely, it, it would definitely help them in uh, saving of energy and they'll actually recoup that cost in a few months. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we open for another questions if anybody wants to ask. Okay. Okay. If there is no questions, I guess we uh, stop the session until now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sunni David. We are so uh, honored to have you here and share to, for you to share all information with us. And then we have this token of appreciation from Masa. We will send to you uh, later on. So we will send to you this. So we are we are so happy to have you as our speaker. Uh, and then we hope to collaborate with you in future if we have any conference. So I hope that you can uh, give your share your knowledge again with us in future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, and I hope uh, you found the session useful. Thank you. Thank you once Shana. again. Uh, so good morning, Prof. Rao, and good evening, everyone else, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dr. Abdullah Mahmood here, senior lecturer, English and Education Master University. It's my pleasant privilege to introduce our very special guest of today, Professor Rao Hamidimari. Professor Dr. Rao Hamidimari is the president of the Institute of Advanced Research India. He also works as a director at Purika Group, a multinational group company based in Nottingham, the United Kingdom. Prior to joining Purico, Professor Rao had had extensive senior leadership experience in universities in New Zealand, Scotland, and England alongside his research. As part of the role at Purico Group, Professor Rao has been developing a research-based university in India. A former graduate of IIT Delhi, India, Osaka University, Japan, and the University of Queensland, Australia, Professor Dr. Rao was the Vice President Development of London South Bank University and worked with Edinburgh Napier University and Massey University in the UK. Professor Rao's current research interests focus on curriculum innovation and novel pedagogies to foster confidence and enterprise in students both at school and university levels. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Rao Bhamidimari. Professor Rao, please.
Prof, uh, your, 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 your mic mute, mute, Prof. Please unmute. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, these days of LinkedIn and uh, Google, these introductions probably have become redundant because everybody would have Googled. Um, but thank you very much indeed for introducing me. Um, now I have a particular challenge uh, of saying something in closing the conference. Um, I have been given actually a topic to focus on that is the industry 4.0. Um, I will try and uh, address some of that, but also bring that together as we are university people, uh, link that to uh, how should we be educating our students to prepare our students for the industry 4.0 environment. So let me perhaps uh, start. Um, I don't control my presentation. I don't know who is controlling it. Um, if we can progress to the next slide. So the, the concept of this industry 4.0 is very relatively new. Uh, a lot has been written about, a lot has been talked about. But um, it's, it's only as recently as six, uh, nearly seven years ago, the concept was actually formally introduced, um, mainly from Germany. But the, the industry 4.0 uh, is actually a, a subliminal description of fourth industrial revolution. So if you look at um, the first industrial revolution, um, we had the, uh, um, the steam, basically the power, steam power, which led to um, the mechanization, the steam engine, therefore uh, logistics, transport, people mobility uh, and that really catalyzed the first industrial revolution around mid 18th century um, through to nearly mid 19th century 100 years then we moved on to second industrial revolution or retrospectively we are calling it industry 2.0 um, where we started to learn about mass production. Otherwise, it was artisan, individual pieces being manufactured um, to mass production. Um, the, the, the invention of electricity in particular, uh, added to it by internal combustion engines, um, the the drainage, the plumbing, the running water made a huge difference to the whole industrial operations, improved communications, the telephones and so on. Um, and more importantly, the chemicals, chemicals, um, the coal, petroleum started to appear. And so the energy, energy basically has made huge difference to the second industrial revolution and helped mass production, reducing the cost of production, making uh, goods and services accessible uh, to much wider parts of the society. Then we moved on to industry 3.0 or third industrial revolution. This is more into more nine, late 1950s um, through to say, for example, mid 1990s. You will see that the second industrial revolution pretty much came to a halt in around the 1900s. And the two world wars basically stopped everything. Otherwise, the third industrial revolution would have been actually between 1900 and 1950 or about that period, first half of 20th century. But the, in, the war itself helped the development of some of the technologies, primarily in Germany, 
um, but subsequently it was civ civilized. The technological developments were civilized in the third industrial revolution, whether it is the concept of microelectronics, invention of transistor, uh, integrated circuits, for example, semiconductors, uh, microprocessors, right? The even the start of internet. All that, if you like, over the 50 years, roughly between 1950 and 2000, uh, accelerated the process of industrial operations. So you will see how, um, so apologies, uh, my clock is chiming. Um, so the three industrial revolutions, both the speed and the scale, have been accelerating. Now we have moved on in, into an environment where that speed is uh, has gone beyond the human capacity to cope with. Human beings have got a half life of their ability to cope with speed, speed of knowledge development, speed of absorption of knowledge, speed of utilization of knowledge, but in the fourth industrial revolution, it's beyond human being, if you like, the speed at which the knowledge and technology have been developing. So we are in a, a completely different paradigm compared to previous three industrial revolutions or industry 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0. Um, it's the all pervasive um, internet and not only pervasive internet but it is mobile internet that has made a huge impact um, the other other thing that people usually don't talk about is ability to sense sensing the sensors um, and those sensors coupled with internet have made it possible for us to move more and more into artificial intelligence. The machine learning, the deep learning, these are all possible because of real time, the real time sensing, data analysis, data interpretation. Um, so it's, it's, we are in an interesting time, how we will manage this. Uh, there are some challenges, I will refer to them shortly there are some key characteristics for uh, the industry 4.0 i think it's useful for us to understand them uh, one is and the most important thing is interoperability this is between physical and cyber we are now beginning to move seamlessly between physical and cyber spaces and that interoperability um, is is a great development, but it itself it also pro challenges us. It challenges us because our ability as a human being to learn learn the knowledge and interpret that knowledge necessary to move between cyber and, cyber and physical spaces is increasingly becoming a limitation. Then there is virtualization. We can actually virtualize everything. In my concluding remark, I will say something about this. We can actually take the old petroleum refinery and then virtualize the whole thing and operate it in the virtual environment. And that ability also has helped us to move into the industry 4.0. Then the decentralization. Until 3.0, we had to do that physically. The integration had to be physical. Now it is all done online. So everything can be um, decentralized. All judgments can be made in, a, made in a decentralized way. Decisions can be taken in a decentralized way. So this decentralization has allowed us 
to make all operations mobile. We can take any operation to any place. Again, the limitation we, we can touch on bri briefly, our human capability to cope with it may come in the way and is coming in the way. The real time capability I already talked about the sensing, collecting data, analyzing data, interpreting data, and using artificial intelligence, making judgments and taking decisions. The modularity uh, is linked, of course, for decentralization. We can um, we can modularize. Let's move uh, the next slide. If we move to the next slide, um, let's move on to another slide. So, let me perhaps briefly talk to you about the. Uh, um, this industry 4.0. This is because of the short time, it is being interpreted very narrowly as though it is all to do with computing and IT. It's far from it. Let's move on. I don't know what time limitations I have, but uh, it's called closing lim remarks. So I don't want to keep you all too late. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so the enabling. Um, uh, the enabling technologies are useful to uh, identify here. So we are talking of artificial intelligence. I refer to uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, in a, a, a most of it is captured in what we call 3D printing. But the principle of additive manufacturing, the nanoscience and nanotechnology, we can create any materials these days with the designed properties. Uh, whether they are metals, plastics, um, biomaterials, we can impart the characteristics we want in order for the materials to be used at any scale, particularly at micro scale or nano scale. Internet of Things, Internet of Things, of course, when applied to industry, it is referred to as industry, industrial Internet of Things. The small difference is Internet of Things is basically a connect. It's networking, networking between um, a, 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 an instrument, a machine um, with the Internet. Whereas the industrial Internet of Things has to link up with numerous machines. So it's, it's a much broader, complex network. Synthetic biology, I mean, this is something not People ignore synthetic biology is a key component of industry 4.0. Whether it is for designing medicines or um, specific food products, whatever it is, the synthetic biology is, is a critical part of it. Uh, automation, auto, automatic robots, cloud computing, simulation, augmented and virtual reality. These are all um, the, the tools and technologies that have become critical in developing ourselves into the industry 4.0 paradigm. Let's move to the next slide. I touched on these, so let's uh, move further. Again, I talked about these. Um, the, these technologies, I think, are very important. Um, and again, we keep these in mind when I come back to concluding the, uh, the education. How do we prepare our young people? Next slide, please. Let's move to the next slide. Um, now, the challenges. The challenges are, um, we, this presents a huge challenge for politicians and the policy policy makers um, all those processes policy making management they are all actually in a manual mode whereas technology all moved into cyber so that's a huge challenge um, small companies which make 95 percent of uh, uh, all the industry cannot cope with it they, they can't afford either the technology or skill development um, Decrease in labor costs is an advantage. 
um, but it creates social challenges, unemployment, in potential increased unemployment. Reshoring of operations is seen as a big advantage in the Western world. Um, but that's a challenge for developing world. Because if, if um, US re, um, reshores all chip making, assembly, Malaysia, for example, is a key country for computers, bringing various components together. Um, if that is all reshored to US, then we have a problem. Dell is a big operation, for example, in Malaysia, right? Yeah. Um, increase in productivity is an advantage. But, you know, the skill development is a problem. Again, it, because it is to do with humans and the ability of the humans to absorb new knowledge, um, the structural potential risk of structural unemployment is a problem. Next slide. Um, the fundamental principle we need to keep in mind in all this is anything that we can digitize, anything that we can digitize will lose its value. And that's, that's, that's the most important thing in the in industry 4.0. So what we keep in mind is what do we focus on what that cannot be digitized in education, particularly because we are preparing our students for the rest of their lifetime, not for just three years of degree or four years of degree, in passing exams, getting the degree. So um, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, I actually I brought all this together into a concept reflected by the next slide, next slide, hopefully. So if we move to the next slide, so how do we actually design education programs? Um, a degree in mathematics, a degree in mechanical engineering, a degree in philosophy, um, by themselves don't mean anything um, unless we actually educate students yes in philosophy or mechanical engineering or microbiology but in addition we have to equip them with other attributes so the concept of design thinking is is very important because design thinking cannot be digitized not yet not yet anyhow um, the art even artificial intelligence and machine learning most of it almost all of it is driven by human beings programming um, so the design thinking is a key element that we must have in all our education programs and then the real world, what it's all about money and business at the end of the day. Um, so a, a great painter, if he or she doesn't know how to actually monetize their paintings, make money out of it, they will remain poor. Um, same with scientists. So, so the concept of business, how this knowledge and creativity can be brought together to monetize, make money. So these elements have to be taught for all our graduates. So if a graduate has to succeed in their life, in the new environment, the traditional degree programs, their curriculum has to be reviewed, re-looked at, rethought. Which, um, the people I've been I've been talking about it for almost 20 years. I started doing little bits here and there in New Zealand, then in Scotland, then in London. But I never because this is a huge task. And then the teachers are the teachers prepared to be able to cope with this kind of a shift. So there are some challenges. The faculty development is as important as degree designing degree programs and preparing students to learn then the societal understanding 
the parents in Asia, parents play a key role. So again, we need to, um, we, we, there is a need for communication, public education, public communication. So it's a big project, but then which are the university, which are the country which succeeds in doing it will be the most successful. Um, so I, I, would, I would hope a university like Masa, which is new, which has got great ambitions, driven by a visionary leadership, will be able to embrace some of these concepts. Computer science today is same as teaching language. Um, whether we teach English or Basa Malaysia, doesn't matter. Um, it's the language is communication. So today computer science is the language of communication. So every student has to be equipped with those basic skills in addition to the business skills and concepts of innovation that comes through design thinking and so on. So I leave it with those thoughts. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy if you have any questions in time. Um, but if not, I think it's a great idea that you started this uh, concept of bringing people together, uh, engineering and technology conference. Uh, pity that it has to be internet through online. But that's okay. We are all learning how to think and operate online. Um, and I do hope at some point I visited the university, I think at least two times. Um, once when Mr. Allah was there. Um, and I do look forward to interacting more with you, whether online or um, who knows, face to face. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. It was great to listen to you. Over to Ms. Ayn Sheila. Okay. Thank you, Prof, for the speech. Okay. Okay. So next, for next event, we will go to the award presenting ceremony for best presenter for MeTech 2021. Okay, uh, so I'm glad to have all of our presenters here as well as our distinguished guests. So we can see who is actually winning the best presenter award. First, we have actually we have first one and now we have one, two, three, four, five. Five best presenter award for today's uh, conference. So get ready for all uh, presenter here. Is your name going to be called? Uh, what uh, winners will win is they will get an e certificate which we send to you later. And after I project your name and the certificate will come out. Okay, so we are ready to announce with the winners. Yeah, uh, hold on. You want to share some screen? Okay, uh, so the first one is. Okay. Okay. For first speaker, for first best presenter award goes to Jabril Abdul Kadir Syed and also Nick Nurzuliana, Nick Nurzuliana binti Muhammad Rajdi with the title of Radio Frequency Identification RFID Badging for Priority Seating Trains Travelers. Congratulations to the first speakers. Thank you. <laughs> okay, for the next best presenter award goes to Hazik Muhammad Rizal and Siti Afifa binti Anwar with the title of Development of Home Physiotherapy Training Device Leg Exercise. Congratulations. Still, we have another three. Let's see who is the lucky one. Next, we have Nor Azliza Ahmad and also Ahmad Nor Hussein Hassan with the title of Development of Web Light Shape Square Electromagnetic Transmitter for Hydrocarbon Explorations. Wow, the title also good. So we are still have two, right? Next is Dr. Ari Muhammad Rizaldi with the title of Dual Circle Corner Detection Method. 
And the last one is Chujun with the title of China DD Global Corporates Digitization Technology Transformations and to Business Innovations and DevOps Development Process Applied. Congratulations to all winners. The e certificates will be sent out to you later after this conference. Okay, without further ado, let's all welcome the conference chair, the one that made this happen, the one that very, very put hard work to this, which is Associate Professor Dr. Abdurrahim Sadiq Bacha, the conference chair from Masa University. Please welcome. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to No audio, Sadiq. Can't hear you. You unmute, you unmute, please. No, we are only request to unmute, not to disappear. Okay. 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 <laughs> and good evening. Today is a wonderful day for us because we have spent uh, resourceful discussions presentation today. I truly appreciate our guests Dato Professor Dr. Ikram Sir, Vice Chancellor Masa University, and Professor Rao, Institute of Advanced Research President, the keynote speakers, guests, presenters, and participants. Together, we have, we have made this event a successful conference. I want to give a special thanks to Professor Allah, Senior Director. Prof. Sri, Director of uh, Research Unit, Ms. Dio, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Guna from Masa Academic Solution, and Dr. Iman, Dean of Faculty of Engineering, and my con committee members for successfully organizing this conference. Finally, I thank Ms. Rasida, who is our MC today for her wonderful words and who made everyone to feel relaxed and connected together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Uh, so, uh, actually, I mean, from Brown, we are so one that you are here today. Uh, okay, is it? Because we will present it from Brown. Um, he, he left? Maybe we can request him. Um, maybe that is the end. So we shall project. Okay, so we are projecting the e certificate that we want to give to Prof. Rao. Yeah, but Prof. is not here. Maybe the internet is slow. It's okay. Uh, so I will. Uh, we will move on to the next one. Okay. In future, Massa is going to organize many, many other conferences. Okay, as you can see in the slide sharing. Okay. So we're going to have a lot of other upcoming events such as Mika, Mihos, Mi Eric. And there are a lot of other more conferences that Masa will actually organize. So in future, we hope that many people will join us and uh, showcase their research and maybe also do connections together. So I hope that uh, other people also can uh, participate in this conference in future. And this information can be get in website. 